You are welcome to submit questions throughout the program by using the Q&A feature provided by WebEx, which can be found on the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of the program, with time permitting, the speakers will address your questions. Should the speakers be unable to reply to all questions during the allotted time today, they will follow up directly after the webinar. You are also welcome to submit questions directly to the presenters following the webinar, and contact information will be displayed at the end of the presentation. In approximately two to three business days following the webinar, Epstein Becker Green will communicate the availability of the webinar recording and access to the PowerPoint materials. At this time, I'd like to turn the webinar over to Josh Stein. Thank you, Kirsten. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to start our presentation off today by focusing on cutting edge issues for retailers relating to accessibility under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And this is a good time to have that kind of conversation because as many of you may know, this July, the ADA will turn 25 years old. And therefore, it should come as little surprise that we're currently seeing a considerable amount of activity from the United States Department of Justice, who regulates the ADA under Title III for accessibility, as well as the courts, advocacy groups, and individual plaintiffs. Indeed, Due to the need to address several recent developments that only came out in the last three to four weeks, I'm actually not going to be discussing service animals today as we originally contemplated. Uh, for those of you who are interested in that topic, and it's a very interesting topic certainly, but one that hasn't had any real recent developments in the last few years, when we do the follow-up email after this presentation, I'm going to attach the slides that I would have been using for that section, and I think you'll find them all fairly self-explanatory. But we've got a lot to cover, so I'm going to get underway. By way of background, we're focusing today on Title III of the ADA. Title III governs places of public accommodation. Liability attaches if you own a place of public accommodation or if you operate it, if you control it, if you're the lessor or the lessee. And because there's joint and several liability, from the point of view of the courts and the regulators, it doesn't matter if you're the landlord or if you're the tenant. Both of you are on the hook for violations of the ADA. And while contract provisions, such as compliance with all laws, are extremely helpful for behind the scenes issues when you're dealing with co-defendants as to who bears certain costs or who's going to make modifications, they really don't have much impact in terms of ultimate liability before the judicial authority or the, uh, the regulator. Now, places of public accommodation include a variety of brick and mortar facilities definitively. For today's purposes, we should all know that it clearly covers virtually every sort of retail establishment. As you'll see in the highlighted sections on the next two slides, there are few as any retail establishments that can escape coverage by the Americans with Disabilities Act. Now, while many people who are aware of Title III of the ADA think about this provision, they view it as a guest services obligation or possibly an architectural code that talks about how high a toilet has to be or how wide a door needs to be. But at, at its core, Title III is a civil rights law and it utilizes an overarching umbrella obligation that's going to drive all of the substantive discussions we have today. And that is that Title III guarantees individuals with disabilities full and equal enjoyment of the goods, services, facilities, privileges, advantages, or accommodations of any place of public accommodation. Now, driving this overarching obligation are a variety of prohibitions such as uh, prohibitions on providing separate benefits or unequal benefits or excluding an individual because they associate with someone with a disability. And further fueling the full and equal enjoyment obligation and helping to flesh it out are additional broad-based obligations. Uh, places of public accommodation can't utilize eligibility criteria to screen out individuals with disabilities. So at its simplest, you can't have a sign that says no one who's blind may enter the store. Uh, you're required to modify policies, practices, and procedures unless doing so would fundamentally alter the goods and services you provide. So for example, if someone with a disability is waiting on a long line in a holiday season to shop, you might have to allow them to store their goods behind your counter until they can pay for them. You wouldn't, on the other hand, have to let them cut the line. You also have to provide auxiliary aids and services to the extent necessary to allow for effective communication. This most commonly involves interacting with customers who are deaf or hard of hearing. It might involve something as simple as utilizing a pen and a pad to communicate, or these days a texting device. And you also have to engage in ongoing barrier removal. And this is what people think about with respect to design and construction under Title III. While today we're going to focus on federal law, 
I would be remiss if I don't tell everyone to always remember that almost all states and many localities also have either uh, distinct accessibility laws or accessibility provisions folded into their human rights laws, uh, as well as provisions in the building code. So as you confront these issues in your jurisdiction, you should certainly talk to your counsel uh, in-house or outside about these sorts of specifics. So the focus of most of my presentation today is going to be about accessible technology. And we're going to start with website accessibility, an issue that has drawn a considerable amount of press in the recent uh, days. The fundamental question that most clients ask me when it comes to Title III and website accessibility is does Title III, as it's currently written, apply to websites? And as we just touched upon, we've established that Title III requires places of public accommodation to provide full and equal enjoyment to individuals with disabilities. But what the law doesn't specifically do is define whether or not a place of public accommodation must be a physical brick and mortar structure or if it can apply more globally. And currently, there is some tension in the courts as to whether or not Title III, as written, can apply to websites. And the government also has its own views, which we'll get into momentarily. Currently, one of the problems is that there are no universally required standards for achieving web accessibility in the private sector, with a few very limited exceptions. Currently, under the Rehabilitation Act, federal agencies do have certain obligations for accessible websites, and therefore, federal contractors who deal with those agencies in very limited, narrow circumstances may have certain obligations. Individuals in the airline industry who are covered by the Air Carrier Access Act also have obligations, as do any websites that re-air footage that have previously broadcast on television with captioning under the FCC's 21st Century Communication and Video Accessibility Act. So where do the courts stand? Up until most recently, the judicial decisions regarding the appropriateness of Title III with respect to non-brick-and-mortar facilities did not focus on websites. They tended to focus on things such as insurance coverage. And as we'll see momentarily, that has changed in recent times, but the basic foundations have kind of split the courts into three distinct camps. The first camp, as I refer to them, are the strict constructionists. They're the ones that would be embraced by Justice Scalia on the Supreme Court. These courts say the ADA is very specific. As I showed you on the slides previously, there are pages of specific brick and mortar locations listed as the examples of places of public accommodation. Therefore, the ADA is meant to only apply Title III to brick and mortar facilities. And if Congress feels otherwise, or the Department of Justice feels otherwise, they should amend the ADA, which they did in other contexts in 2008, or they should issue new regulations, which they did in 2010. The Third Circuit and the Sixth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit are the, court, are the courts that have district courts that have fallen into this camp. On the flip side, uh, predominantly on the East Coast in the First and Second Circuit, but also in the Seventh Circuit, there are courts that have adopted what I've deemed the spirit of the law. These courts base their decisions on the idea that the driving purpose of the ADA is to allow for individuals with disabilities to actively and effectively participate as members of society and that they should have full and equal access to all means of communication, interaction, and so on as other individuals in society. And therefore, if you're going to apply the ADA to enact its purposes, you need to allow it to evolve as technology evolves, because back in the 19, early 1990s when the ADA was enacted, no one could possibly have envisioned the impact that websites would currently have on society. Some could even argue that having access to the internet might be more important than having access to brick and mortar facilities this day. And then the third group, which we'll talk about in detail in a second, kind of splits the baby. They're the nexus courts, and these are predominantly California courts under the Ninth Circuit. And in that instance, they said, in order for Title III to apply to a website, there needs to be a nexus between the website and a place of public accommodation traditionally covered by Title III. So we're going to move now to key decisions that specifically address websites, and we're going to start with what remains today the most well-known and seminal of these cases, the National Federation for the Blind against Target. And NSB is a group that we will see again and again as we go through the slides. The target decision addressed whether Title III applies to only physical brick-and-mortar locations or also covers the Internet. In short, NSB alleged that, that Target violated Title III and California state accessibility uh, statutes by the fact that Target.com was inaccessible to individuals with disabilities. 
While there were many examples, the clearest example I can give is that if any of us who are full-sighted individuals went to their website and we wanted to shop for a hand blazer, we could see the image and see that we were looking at the style and it's hand blazer. The website was coded in a way that if I were a person who was blind and I put a screen reading program on my computer and ran it on Target's website, those images wouldn't have described a tan blazer, uh, medium, $49.99, what have you. It would have simply said image, or it would have given the URL, or it would have had a series of gibberish code. And therefore, the NFB argued that individuals who were blind could not have full and equal enjoyment of the Target website. Target defended on a motion to dismiss and argued that the ADA and California state laws only applied to clear brick and mortar facilities. And since Target.com was not such a facility, it didn't apply. It also asserted that the goods and services that were offered on the website were offered in a variety of other contexts. The court's decision here hangs not only on one word, but on a word that is two letters long. If you recall, I said that this is full and equal enjoyment of a place of public accommodation. And the court drew on that of and said it did not say full and equal enjoyment of goods and services in a place of public accommodation. And therefore, because there was a relationship between the goods and services offered on the website, the Target.com allowed you to shop, it gave you coupons, it gave you uh, previews of inventory coming in, customer service information, and so forth, there was a sig significant nexus between the website and the brick and mortar stores, and therefore there was obligations under Title III for accessibility. Uh, because it was a motion to dismiss, the court did not rule as to whether or not the alternative methods would have sufficed under the statute. So having lost the motion to dismiss, Target settled. And as you can see, they established a $6 million damages fund. They had to make their website accessible in a fairly expedited time frame. They had to pay the NSB to train their own staff, and they had to pay what I'm sure were a significant amount of attorney's fees and costs. So what happened after Target? Pretty much exactly as you'd expect. There were increased litigations and threats of litigation. There was increased attention from DOJ and state regulators at the Attorney General level. And we also saw a rise of significant number of private settlements with advocacy groups or cooperative agreements, which advocacy groups like to trumpet being the result of structured negotiations. But I think in fairness, many of you would say what it actually is is a degree of threat or extortion whereby you receive a letter from an advocacy group telling you that your website is not accessible and telling you that if you do not reach some sort of negotiated settlement with them, they will go to DOJ or they will go to federal court themselves and file a litigation. Now, most of the decisions you'll see are in the Ninth Circuit and their district courts. And predominantly, they stress what we saw in Target and what the Ninth Circuit's previous non-website uh, precedent had said, which is that entities that are purely cyberspace and not related to physical brick and mortar locations are not covered by Title III. So we see that applied with Google and YouTube and MySpace and Facebook and eBay and, and many of these giant, monolithic, well-known, cyber-only entities. I would note the eBay decision at least left the door open for the idea that under state law there might be obligations because the California state law had a broader definition of what establishments were covered under their accessibility provision. We see this again with Redbox uh, last year and then in a decision uh, so you've got this general line that's been drawn regarding these nexus cases and the Ninth Circuit Court saying that you need the connection to a brick and mortar. However, uh, just about two weeks ago, the District of Vermont, which for those of you who know is a Second Circuit uh, court, it ruled the exact reverse. The case was against Scribd, which you may or may not know is a company that provides online access to books and course materials and magazines and, and various other printed materials and in that case, when Scribd made the same motion to dismiss that had proven successful in the California jurisdiction, the District of Vermont rejected the motion to dismiss, and it said if you look at the language of Title III, honing on the idea that in a few rare instances, instead of having simply the place listed like pet store, zoo, aquarium, it went on to say business establishment. Because of DOJ's position and interpretation historically that this applies, and we'll get to that again in a minute, and because of the general idea of serving the purpose of the ADA, which I talked about earlier, all of this combines to suggest 
that the ADA and Title III can apply to an establishment that offers goods and services to the public, even if they do not have a physical location. And I understand that some might say, well, this seems like one offshoot and that there's not as much of a split, but I'm going to demonstrate the split by showing you two cases brought against the same defendant making the exact same allegations that come out in the exact opposite direction. So Netflix, as many of you know, over the last few years has moved from renting or sending you DVDs to allowing you access online either via device, a streaming device like a Roku or a Fire Stick, or actually giving you online access through your computer. So the National Association for the Deaf sued Netflix, alleging that because the videos were not captioned, they were inaccessible for individuals who were deaf and therefore in violation of Title III of the ADA. The First Circuit in response, uh, I'm sorry, the District of Massachusetts in the First Circuit, in response to Netflix's motion to dismiss, denied the motion to dismiss and said that First Circuit precedent clearly intended for the ADA to apply broadly. And as you'll see in the highlighted text, they very clearly said that excluding businesses that sell services through the internet from the ADA would run afoul of the purposes and would severely frustrate Congress's intent for full and equal enjoyment. They also cited the of versus in language and at language that I referred to in Target, and finally said, if you want to be very specific, you could look at the existing definitions under Title III, service establishment, place of exhibition or entertainment, rental establishment, and arguably Netflix would have fit under all of this. So in response to losing their motion to dismiss, Netflix entered into a settlement which required them to make 100% of their movies and other streaming content captioned or subtitled, it required them to pay close to three quarters, over three quarters of a million dollars in attorney's fees, plus additional compliance monitoring costs to the National Association of the Deaf. Now let's rerun the exact same case out in the Northern District of California and the Ninth Circuit. Now as we talked about, they are a nexus or strict interpretation court depending on how you look at things. And here a private plaintiff made the exact same allegation except the district court in California ruled that because Netflix's website isn't a physical place, under Ninth Circuit law, it would not be a place of public accommodation. So the plaintiff appealed in this case, and I'll talk about why that might have happened in a moment, because it might seem a bit counterintuitive given that the District of Massachusetts case would have substantively resolved the exact same issues. Uh, but oral argument was held in March of this past year, and uh, a week and a day ago, the Ninth Circuit ruled and in issuing a decision that was not even three pages long, the Ninth Circuit held that if you are purely a cyber entity with no ties to a physical brick and mortar location, then that Ninth Circuit holds that the ADA will not apply to you in that instance. So we've got diametric splits on the East Coast versus the West Coast. And you might say, well, why on earth did they go through this? And the answer is almost certainly attorney's fees. Under state law in California plus Obviously, under the ADA as well, attorney fees can attach with a decision, and I'm guessing that there was a dispute as to what those attorney fees should have been to make that case go away. Now, you might say, okay, you basically discussed cases in two or three jurisdictions. There's, I'm in the country where there is no law. Josh, you've suggested that there are arguments to be made. I'm prepared to defend this if I come up with a case or an advocacy group approaches me. And the reason why I might suggest against that is what follows. And that's the fact that the Department of Justice, the regulators here, clearly, vehemently take the position that Title III has always and will continue to apply to websites as it is currently drafted. And as we'll talk about in a moment, they're in the process of promulgating regulations that will cover the private sector within the next few years. So therefore, by the time you went through discovery and a district court situation and, and someone appealed up to a circuit court, even if you ultimately prevailed, it might be a pure victory where you've spent seven figures on fees and ultimately DOJ will come and pull the rug out from right under your successful uh, resolution. So as I said, DOJ across the board for over 15 years has taken the position that Title III applies to websites. They've done this in briefs, in guidance publi uh, publications, in testimony before Congress, and the clearest indications were quotes that were given in speeches set two years apart from then Assistant Attorney General of the Civil Rights Division, Tom Perez, who is now at the Department of Labor, where he said, it is and has been the position of the Department of Justice since the late 1990s that Title III of the ADA applies to websites. Companies that do not consider accessibility in their website or product development will come to regret that decision. And he said that twice in two large form public speeches in 2010 and again in 2012. 
So what's DOJ doing about this right now? Well, the first thing they're doing is fairly slowly promulgating private sector website regulations. Five years ago, at the 20th anniversary of the ADA, DOJ issued an advance notice of proposed rulemaking for private sector website accessibility regulation. The scope of the accessibility standards at the time were looking to be limited to either public accommodations that offer goods and services in conjunction with the physical location, such as Target, or exclusively on the internet, but if reduced to a brick and mortar, would effectively have been targeted. So Amazon is a very good example of that. Uh, it proposed staggered compliance dates and ramp ups and a few affirmative defenses. Well, now we're staring at the precipice of the 25th anniversary five years later, and all indications out of Washington at this point is that the NPRM, the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, should issue sometime between Memorial Day and July 4th. Uh, at that point, once that is issued, there'll be periods of approximately 90 days for notice and comment. Then there'll be further uh, revisions. So all in all, you probably will not have effective private sector DOJ regulations governing this for at least 12 to 18 months. Now, one question people have is, okay, academically this is very interesting and it, it's certainly not something that is very common for us to think about, but reality, what's the risk here? So what I've done over the next several pages, and we're going to breeze through these, are give you a highlight of settlement agreements, both with the Department of Justice and with private advocacy groups that affect the retail industry with advocacy groups and more broadly with DOJ. And as you can see here, without naming names, they're all highlighted, you can see a large variety of fairly substantial entities that are all over different aspects of the retail sector that have dealt with website accessibility. And as you see, they require making the website accessible, they may require training, they may require uh, various compliance monitoring, and usually there's some sort of payment as well. Now, with respect to the Department of Justice, uh, when I first started doing these presentations a few years ago, you had one kind of view that was in place. But we've seen two trends over the last five years from DOJ that I want to bring to your attention. And the first is, initially, website accessibility settlements with DOJ were effectively the result of bootstrapping. Let's say you had a complaint where your store didn't allow a service animal in, or you didn't have uh, accessible point of sale counters. You have a DOJ complaint, you go to the table to negotiate, and while they were there, they would say, oh, and by the way, your website isn't accessible, and if you wish to settle this, that's going to be part of the settlement. And if you go back to these settlements that I've highlighted, the website provisions, you'll see that the websites are usually a very small folding. However, most recently, including earlier this month, DOJ has now begun to bring website-only uh, actions to pursue settlements under just website accessibility. Second, you'll see in the earlier settlement agreements that the standard that DOJ holds people to is all over the place. And quite frankly, I used to tell clients that depending upon the knowledge base of the person you're dealing with, both on your end of the table representing you and the investigator, and the kind of context by which the allegations arose, and how committed you were to accessibility in other contexts, you could negotiate something that was far short from what DOJ might have otherwise wanted. But as you'll see in the most recent settlement, DOJ has honed in on a specific standard that I'll talk about uh, in a brief moment. And that standard is the World Wide Web Consortium's Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, the WCAG or the WCHE 2.0 at levels A and AA. Uh, the World Wide Web Consortium's Website Accessibility Initiative is sort of a think tank. It combines people from academia, programmers, the government, advocacy groups, and commerce to improve the internet. And they have guidelines that were most recently issued in 2008, of which they have supplemented subsequently, which the government, advocacy groups, and, and even those who have endeavored this task of making a website accessible on the business side have all looked to as reasonable uh, places to which to look at. So that is where people are. So the question I get is, okay, so you've, you've scared me. I understand what's going on. What do I do about it at this point? And the first thing I think you need to do is to get a sense from your IT group, from your outside vendors, as to whether or not your company even considers this issue right now. It might be that recently many companies that didn't do it in the past have sort of over the last year or two begun to address it as new things roll out. 
Secondarily, if the issue comes up that you've done nothing, you should consider auditing your website. There are a few over-the-counter products that can give you a very quick and dirty look, uh, but ultimately you're going to want to do a programmer-based and a user-based audit of your website, and we can always talk about that offline in the future. Um, when doing this, again, I simply say, remember state and local laws, but for now, if you're not a federal agency, there's not all that much to be concerned with. Now I'm going to move to another accessible technology issue, one that has proven particularly fertile ground and high risk for uh, in the fertile ground for regulators and plaintiffs and high risk for retail industry uh, more so than almost anything else recently. As I'm sure all of you know, uh, retailers have started to use touchscreen devices uh, fairly endemically across the board. They use them for points of sale, in, for debit cards, credit cards. They've used them for information to patrons, rental kiosks, to purchase tickets, parking, and so on. And we've seen a who's who of retailers across the board be sued by advocacy groups and plaintiffs about this. Now, the first question here is, well, what do I have, what obligations do I have right now? The first is, ATMs are currently covered by the ADA. There's no questions about that. Your ATM machines on premises should be accessible, and so on. Uh, secondarily, the Rehab Act, if you're a federal agency or if you're doing business with that, you should at least have some sense of the obligations under the Rehab Act, and if you are an airport kiosk, you need to be accessible under the Air Carriers Act. Now, for retailers, California state law, its financial code section 13082, focuses on providing accessible points of sale devices for those with visual impairment for devices where you need to use a point of sales, enter a PIN number, or run your debit card or your credit card. And since 2010, you've had an obligation in California to have accessible touchscreen devices in that context. How does Title III apply? Well, again, it goes back to the same overarching obligations under Title III we talked about earlier, full and equal enjoyment and provision of auxiliary aids and services. The complaints we're seeing against retailers are that patrons who are blind are denied full and equal enjoyment of their shopping experiences because they cannot use the touchscreen devices on their own, and worse, to the extent it involves a PIN number, it's an invasion in privacy because they're forced to turn over their PIN number to another person. DOJ's position, not surprisingly, is aligned with the plaintiffs. They have taken the position uh, by issuing formal statements of interest, which are sort of like amicus briefs, or by joining where necessary with private party defend, uh, plaintiffs and joining into complaints, and they said that simply providing ulterior ways to access uh, the point of sale devices or the touch screen are not going to be sufficient. Just so you know that this is not an insignificant issue, this slide uh, highlights a, a who's who of people across retail who have been involved in this. I, I will tell you if I had included people who are participating in this webinar, uh, according to this morning's RSVP list, the slide would have been an additional full page. Uh, so everyone should be concerned about that. What should you do about this very quickly? Uh, obviously take care of the traditional brick and mortar stuff. Make sure the touchscreen devices are on accessible routes, that there's clear floor space, that people can reach the devices who are in a wheelchair, uh, that they're not blocked by objects. With respect to the technology issues, you need to worry about whether or not there's input controls. Are there tactile keyboards with braille or raised characters? Are there, if there's audio or if there needs to be audio instructions to how to use complicated measures in the touchscreen, is there an audio jack, a headset jack? Has their captioning if there's non-text audio that has substantive impact? Uh, temporarily, what can you do? Uh, between all of us, in some circumstances, I've had some success with regulators where a retailer provides during all store hours with someone dedicated to helping all patrons, including those with disabilities, but ultimately regulators do not like operational fixes that are dependent upon other individuals because one, they require interaction with someone else when everyone else who doesn't have a disability can do it on their own, and two, because other humans are fallible, and if they go on a break or they're helping someone else, it forces the individual with a disability to wait. I am almost out of time, so I'm going to briefly talk about one very basic thing uh, that's in the more traditional brick-and-mortar context. As many of you know, retail stores have an obligation to provide uh, accessible routes throughout the store to the merchandise, in and out of the store, to the restrooms, to fitting rooms, to points of sale, what have you. Now, the regulations have always allowed for exemptions for this for temporary uh, obstruction. Well, last month, the Ninth Circuit issued a ruling against Pier 1, which detailed exactly what it meant to be a temporary obstruction. 
And long and short of it, uh, without getting into details of the case, I wanted to highlight some takeaways that you could get from the decision. The first is, while it's always good to have a policy that a store is going to maintain and monitor accessible routes, simply having that policy, if it's not followed, isn't going to get you out of anything. If anything, it's going to be evidence that you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. An obstruction is not temporary, effectively, if a retailer puts the onus on the individual to come and complain that something is blocking their way. Again, the regulators want the individual with a disability to be able to access the store as anyone else without having to go and get assistance. It is also not going to get a retailer out of the circumstance if you find that it's because of the other patrons visiting your store that the uh, obstruction has been placed. And finally, even if something might truly be temporary, if you constantly have your aisles riddled with temporary obstructions, the totality of your circumstances will lead DOJ or a court to take a position that you're not actually honoring your obligation. So what is a true temporary obstruction? It's one that's temporarily there for a brief period of time. Doing restocking, some child throws up and someone's cleaning that up, uh, taking down or fixing something temporarily a few hours, that's fine. What's not going to be, you put up your seasonal display for the holidays between Thanksgiving and Christmas, or, or maybe between Halloween and Christmas now, that's not temporary, even though it's not going to be there full time. Uh, I know I went through a lot. I will certainly answer questions on the back end or in follow-up afterwards, but at this point, I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Valerie Butera. Thank you, Josh. OSHA is paying much more attention to the retail industry than it has in the past. We're seeing increased levels of scrutiny and enforcement. Today I'm going to talk to you about what you should be looking out for. I've split up OSHA's top 10 most cited standards for retail into two slides because OSHA distinguishes between two large groups of various types of retailers. The most often cited standards between the two groups overlap quite a bit, but there are a couple of differences between the top 10 lists for the two groups. I'll briefly explain the types of citations I'm seeing in all of these categories and how you can best protect yourself from receiving such citations. This list is the top 10 most frequently cited standards for the following types of retailers. Automotive dealers and auto parts dealers, furniture and home furnishing stores, electronics and appliance stores, building material and supply stores, lawn and garden equipment and supply stores, grocery stores, specialty food stores, beer, wine, and liquor stores, health and personal care stores, gasoline stations, clothing and clothing accessory stores, shoe stores, and jewelry, luggage, and leather goods stores. Topping the list is hazard communication. <clears throat> the hazard communication standard was overhauled in 2012, and employers are expected to be in compliance with nearly every aspect of the revised rule by June 1, 2015, with just a few exceptions. This means that generally you should have new safety data sheets in place for any hazardous chemicals that your employees may encounter, a labeling system informing your employees of the danger, dangers associated with the chemicals that they work with, and a comprehensive training program to ensure that your workers understand how to identify potential hazards. You must also ensure that your employees understand your program and the training provided. If asked, your employees need to be able to explain the program to OSHA. Next is powered industrial trucks. What you need here are well-trained and licensed forklift drivers, and you should maintain copies of all of their licenses. Forklifts should be checked to ensure that they are safe for operation before every use, and you should record your findings. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, you should have a disciplinary system for employee failure to follow your company's forklift safety rules. I cannot tell you how many OSHA forklift violations I have witnessed personally when auditing facilities. Employees do not seem to take forklift safety very seriously, which has made forklift violations very low-hanging fruit for OSHA compliance officers. Next, we come to wiring methods, components, and equipment for general use. Things to look out for here include faulty wiring, improper use of extension cords, for example, daisy chaining of extension cords, and blocked electrical panels. You should ensure that there is always ready access to panels and nothing is stacked near or in front of them impeding access. General electrical requirements comes next. 
What I've seen most often here are citations for insufficient space around electrical equipment. Here again, you want ready access to equipment if needed, but you don't want your employees stationed to work near large pieces of electrical equipment unless it cannot be avoided. If that can't be avoided, a number of safeguards need to be put in place to protect employees from electrocution hazards. Next, we come to maintenance, safeguards, and operational features for exit routes. And exit routes have become sort of a cash cow for OSHA. This is another example of low-lying fruit. OSHA compliance officers are, in fact, encouraged to check ex exit routes at every inspection. At every inspection. OSHA's exit route requirements are not at all intuitive. For example, you must mark every door situated along an exit route with an identifier, such as a sign that says closet or just a sign that simply says not an exit. Many employers do not know this or some of the other obscure exit route requirements. So it's extremely easy for OSHA to identify violations. You must keep your exit routes clear and your employees must know how and when to use them. Next up is respiratory protection. OSHA requires the use of respirators to protect employees from breathing contaminated and or oxygen deficient air when effective engineering controls are not feasible or while they are being instituted. Respirators must be properly fit tested and employees must be trained on proper usage. And we come to portable fire extinguishers. This is another easy hit for OSHA. You need to ensure that your fire extinguishers are checked regularly and tags should identify when they were last checked. Your employees should be trained in how to use them. Some companies prefer to designate only a handful of employees to operate fire extinguishers. And while this is technically acceptable, it obviously leaves open the possibility of catastrophe if one of your designated employees happens to not be around when a fire starts. In my opinion, training all of your employees on proper fire extinguisher use is a worthwhile investment in safety. Next, we have guarding floor and wall openings and holes. This item is fairly self-explanatory. Employers need to identify openings or holes that could injure employees. And depending on the type of opening, OSHA requires a variety of protective measures to put in place. Next, we come to personal protective equipment. You must provide employees with whatever safety gear necessary for them to safely perform their jobs. This can be anything from gloves to goggles to earplugs. The possibilities are literally endless. The most important thing is that you evaluate each job task in your workplace and determine what, if any, personal protective equipment is required for employee safety and make it available to affected employees. Next comes housekeeping. This is another easy target for OSHA. Objects obstructing exits and electrical panels will be cited under housekeeping as well as the separate standards I discussed a moment ago. Other common triggers are the presence of vermin and unsanitary break rooms. This is a top 10 list for retail group two. And this group of retailers includes sporting goods, hobby, musical instrument and bookstores, department stores, warehouse clubs, florists, office supplies, stationery and gift stores, used merchandise stores, pet and pet supply stores, art dealers, mobile home dealers, tobacco stores, online retailers and mail order houses, vending machine operators, and gas stations. For the most part, you will see that OSHA has cited this group of retailers for the same perceived hazards the agency has pursued in the first group of retailers. There are a couple of noteworthy additions here, though. The first is lead. OSHA has established a permissible exposure limit to a number of substances, including lead. The best way to protect yourself from receiving a citation for exposing employees to excessive amounts of lead is to conduct initial testing to determine how much, if any, lead exists in the workplace. If testing shows that the level is too high, OSHA requires that you take a number of steps to control or abate the hazard. Critically, your employers should be provided with respirators to help ensure their health, ensure their health and safety. Employees must then receive medical monitoring to ensure that they are not being adversely affected by lead. Lead should be removed from the environment if possible. 
and if it's not possible, the employer must comply with a number of additional housekeeping and facility requirements to keep employees safe. Design and construction requirements for exit routes is another important addition. Here we get into a number of technical requirements for exit routes and doors. OSHA wants to see that your exit routes are permanent and that there are enough exit routes to get all of your employees to safety. Exit routes must meet minimum height and width requirements. Your exit doors must always remain unlocked. Exit doors must be side hinged as must every door used connect any room to an exit route. Again, these rules are very specific and not necessarily intuitive, so OSHA has been able to find violations of the standard easily. And we must not forget OSHA's general duty clause. Section 5 of the Occupational Safety and Health Act provides that each employer shall furnish to each of his employees employment and a place of employment which are free from recognized hazards that are causing or are likely to cause death or serious physical harm to his employees. Known commonly as the general duty clause, this part of the statute empowers OSHA to issue citations, even in cases in which no specific OSHA standard applies. Notably, of the citations issued to retailers in both of the groups we just discussed last year, General duty clause violations were ranked extremely high in frequency, nearly making it into the top 10 most cited standards for both groups. Just a few weeks ago, on March 18th, OSHA won a key victory for its policy favoring expansive use of the general duty clause when Walmart Stores, Inc. withdrew its long-standing legal challenge of an OSHA citation arising from the tragic trampling death of a store employee during a Black Friday sales event in 2008, and OSHA is publicly lauding that move. The case has long been considered an important test case to OSHA's policy in the Obama administration to more forcefully employ use of the general duty clause to address potential hazards that the agency has yet to address through rulemaking. By accepting this citation, Walmart has opened the doors to more aggressive OSHA inspections complete with compliance officers who now have every reason to believe that anything they perceive to be a, a possible hazard to your employees can be successfully prosecuted under the general duty clause. Turning to workplace violence, although OSHA is putting a great deal of resources into its workplace violence efforts in all industries, one of its prime targets is late night retail establishments. The agency has published a 37-page guide to prevention strategies for workplace violence at these establishments on its website. Every employer should have a workplace violence policy in place and ensure that their employees understand it. Late night retailers are at a particular risk, however. If OSHA finds that such employers have failed to provide sufficient protections for their employees, the agency can easily point to its published guidance and issue a general duty clause citation for failing to adopt its suggestions. Late night retailers in New Mexico and Washington State should also be aware that OSHA approved state plans in those states enforce workplace violence regulations specific to late night retailers doing business in those states. Next we'll talk a little bit about temporary employees. On July 15, 2014, OSHA issued a policy memo to its field offices outlining when a compliance officer visiting a work site should enlarge the inspection to include temporary agencies providing workers to the site. Generally, compliance officers were instructed that whenever a temporary worker was exposed to a violation, the compliance officer should determine whether the temporary agency was aware of the hazards or could have known about them. As a result, OSHA inspections involving temporary employee agencies increased 322% in fiscal 2014, but only 15% of the inspections resulted in citations being issued to temporary employee agencies. Don't be fooled by these numbers. OSHA has cited many host employers for alleged violations related to temporary workers, but found no basis for issuing citations to the temporary staffing agencies involved. Host employers should consider the safety of all of their employees. Make sure that in addition to protecting your own employees, you are complying with OSHA's policies and best practices 
for working with contractors and temporary employees. Training is particularly important here. Your temporary employees must be provided the same degree of safety training that you provide your own employees. That being said, the safest course of action is to treat your temporary employees just like your own employees in every way. Personal protect, protective equipment, hazard communication, and the like. Temporary employees must receive the same degree of protection as the host employer's employees. In the few instances where a staffing agency has been cited during these inspections, Again, lack of training seems to be the most frequently alleged violation. OSHA's temporary work initiative is slated to continue throughout 2015. <clears throat> and whistleblower claims are on the rise. New claims have dramatically increased in the vast majority of the 22 different whistleblower statutes that OSHA handles. Complaints of employer retaliation under the OSHA statute alone have risen 70% since 2005. But whistleblower investigators rarely find merit to those claims. Of the total number of claims determinations from 2005 to present, only 2% have been resolved on the merit. By comparison, during the same time period, 60% have been dismissed. Others have been withdrawn, kicked out, or resolved in some type of settlement. Complaints are expected to continuously rise nonetheless as employees have become much more familiar with their rights under the various statutes containing whistleblower provisions. Particularly savvy complainants are filing complaints under multiple statutes simultaneously. Employers still need to be especially wary of the various whistleblower protections. OSHA has extended, ex expended a great deal of resources and placed special emphasis on the whistleblower protection program. Accordingly, employers must, at a minimum, have a disciplinary policy in effect, apply it consistently, keep excellent records of disciplinary, disciplinary actions, performance reviews, and the like, in case you find yourself among the unlucky few with cases that proceed to inspections and decisions on the merits. Successful whistleblower complaints have resulted in penalties in excess of a million dollars. Recently, there has been a lot of activity surrounding OSHA's injury and illness record keeping role. This is a list of the categories of retailers that are considered relatively low risk by OSHA and generally need not keep formal records of workplace injuries and illnesses. On occasion, however, the Bureau of Labor Statistics may instruct retailers in these categories that they must record injuries and illnesses for a specified period of time, sort of like a spot check to ensure that there are no problems arising within an otherwise exempt group of employers. Should the Bureau select your business for such a spot check, it will notify you in writing. Unless your company is among the lucky few categories of retailers we just discussed, OSHA requires that you maintain work-related injury and illness logs. In the past, the forms have been hard copy documents. OSHA has announced, however, that in August of this year, it will publish a new rule requiring the vast majority of employers that keep OSHA injury and illness logs to provide injury and illness information to OSHA electronically on a frequent basis. This will enable OSHA to more quickly identify workplaces with high rates of injuries and illnesses and dispatch compliance officers to those locations to conduct inspections. Disturbingly, the electronically submitted injury and illness data will be scrubbed of identifiers and then placed on a publicly accessible database, so the public will be able to review employers' injury and illness data. OSHA will make employers' injury and illness information public through a website that will enable anyone to search employers' injury and illness records. The public will be able to search how many injuries and illnesses occurred at each workplace, the title of the affected employee, circumstances related to each incident. Because of the circumstances of each incident will be included in the searchable data, it is entirely possible that the privacy rights of the affected employee could be compromised. Although OSHA insists that private, private information will be scrubbed from the data before it's released to the public, it has not identified a means for doing so, nor has it established how it will accomplish this task when it is already lacking in both the physical and physical resources necessary to do the job. 
even if OSHA can effectively scrub the obvious, identify, uh, the obvious identifiers, other information in the publicly shared data, such as the date of the injury, type of injury, treatment, and job title, can be used in an attempt to determine the identity of protected workers. Another concern for employers is the possibility of being painted as a bad actor, apathetic about employee health and safety, as the injury and illness reports do not provide the public with full context of what happened. And union organizing activity is on the rise in the retail industry. Retail is an attractive target for unionization because of the ever-increasing number of jobs that it provides and projections for continued rapid growth. Retail is expected to be the second largest producer of new jobs over the next decade, second only to the healthcare industry and job generation. The public release of retail employers' injury and illness data will enable unions to easily identify retailers with higher than average numbers of injuries and illnesses as targets for unionization. All employers, including retail, is not required to keep OSHA injury and illness logs must now report all work-related fatalities within eight hours to OSHA and all work-related inpatient hospitalizations, amputations, and all losses of an eye within 24 hours to OSHA. You can report those injuries by calling OSHA's confidential 1-800 number, calling your area office during normal business hours, or using the new online form that will quote-unquote soon be available. For the foreseeable future, should you need to report one of these incidents, I would recommend doing so by phone. OSHA has been promising that the online form is coming soon for months now, but we have not seen any indication that will be available in the near future. The new rule has had a significant immediate impact. About 40% of the injury and fatality incidents that have been reported in, com in compliance with this rule have led to OSHA inspections. As OSHA predicted, the rule has put OSHA in contact with employers that it did, it did not pay much attention to before. In addition to these inspections, OSHA has asked a large number of employers to investigate the incidents themselves, to find the root causes, and then report back to the agency what they have learned and their plans for addressing their findings. These root cause investigations are troubling, as OSHA has not made clear whether it plans to use companies' own investigations as a basis for future OSHA inspections. Should you be instructed by OSHA to complete a root cause investigation, I would advise involving counsel for additional guidance. Finally, there are a couple of state and local programs I want to make you aware of. Federal OSHA is currently running a local emphasis program targeting clothing stores, department stores, and other miscellaneous store retailers for enforcement in Hawaii, Guam, American Samoa, and Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands. Compliance officers have been instructed to pay particular attention to electrical hazards, forklifts, material handling hazards, and the design, construction, and maintenance of exit ropes. Although there is no official local emphasis program for the area, high-end boutiques have been targeted for enforcement in Las Vegas, Nevada. Compliance officers there have been focusing on the same group of potential hazards as those identified in the island enforcement program. And finally, state plan requirements for retailers. You may already be aware that a California state plan requires all employers to have an injury and illness prevention program. This is a comprehensive health and safety program that incorporates significant employee involvement and management commitment to creating a safe and healthy workplace. What you may not have heard about yet is a new requirement of the Minnesota state plan called a Workplace Accident and Injury Reduction Program, or AWARE. The AWARE program requirements are quite similar to those of California's Injury and Illness Prevention Program, although not all employers are required to have such a program. Virtually every type of retailer doing business must create a plan. Employers have until June 29, 2015 to comply. Employers should be on notice that the AWARE program applies to virtually any company engaged in a wholesale or retail sales in the state including all retailers exempted from injury and illness reporting under federal OSHA. Basically, if you sell something in Minnesota, anything, you must employ an AWARE program at your Minnesota workplaces. Thanks very much, and I'll turn it over to Susan. Okay. Thanks so much, Valerie. So this part of the presentation is going to address state and city laws' impact on retailers' policies and procedures. 
Um, you know, as many of you have, have spoken with me uh, previously about, uh, you know, it used to be that we just had to keep up with what the federal law was and make sure our policies and procedures were up to date. Uh, but in the last couple of years or so, um, the states and, and, and even the cities have been passing a lot of laws uh, that have really impacted employers' policies and procedures. So I thought I'd address some of those and just give you some things to think about as you may be reviewing your handbooks, your other documents, your policies and procedures. So the first thing I'll mention uh, is the, the paid sick leave laws. That's the bane of a lot of our, our existence, I think, um, with respect to our, our handbooks. Um, you know, as you know, uh, as you may or may not know, in 2006, San Francisco was the first U.S. city to require paid sick leave. And since then, really, the momentum has kind of picked up among other cities and states as well. Um, while, while many of our clients, and most of you, you know, on, on the line, probably already provide either sick time or, or PTO to employees, uh, when these laws do get passed in jurisdictions where you have stores or other operations, you really have to make sure that your policies and procedures address the requirements and incorporate the requirements of those laws. So some of the biggest changes to policies that we've seen is that a lot of these paid sick time laws require paid sick time to be provided to part-time employees, not just full-time employees. So a lot of our clients have had to revise their policies to ensure that that's the case. Um, providing sick time in less than one day increments as well. Uh, depending on the law, some of these laws require employers to provide sick time in half day increments, some in two hour increments, and some even in one hour increments. So those are, are things to think about as well. Some carryover rules with respect to sick time. Most uh, employers that have sick time policies would never carry over sick time, um, but some of these laws do require time to be carried over. The reasons that you can use this sick time, uh, it's not only for employees' illnesses, but also the illnesses of family members, um, some public health emergencies, sometimes issues related to um, domestic violence. So again, the laws kind of differ uh, depending on, um, depending on the, the law in the state or the city that's applicable. There are also some notice requirements with respect to these laws. So you really do want to be aware that not only do you need to comply, but you also may be required to provide notices. Um, for your employees. Now, an issue here is now, you know, many companies like to have one employee handbook that they provide to everybody. Um, sometimes we'll do things like have a local practices section for states like California, uh, you know, that might have some special rules. Um, you know, but nowadays, many of our clients are really kind of separating out their handbooks and saying, look, there's just too many differences in all these states, um, and they may decide to have different handbooks uh, for each place where they, where they have operations. So really something to think about. And it's not just the handbook. Um, another thing that we uh, need to think about is, is the ban the box movement. Not sure if uh, all of you are familiar, but this really pertains uh, to the employment application and, and the types of questions that you can even ask in connection with hiring employees. Um, so the Ban the Box movement is basically a campaign by various civil rights groups and advocates for ex-offenders, and it's really aimed at persuading employers to remove from their applications um, that little checkbox, you know, the Ban the Box, right, check the, the checkbox that asks if an applicant has, been, has a criminal record. Um, so, you know, the laws differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, some of these laws just prohibit employers from asking the question on the application. Um, some of the laws go further to uh, prohibit employers from asking the question at certain points during the, the interview process or the application process. And some states' laws even require employers not to ask that question at any kind of criminal background until an, a conditional offer of employment is made. So we really do want to be careful, again, not just on the applications for employment, but really about the whole process itself. Now, speaking of employment applications, there are some state rules that do impact what our employment applications look like. Again, the ban the box movement is, is the biggest issue, but aside from that, there are other state limitations and considerations, even with respect to criminal conviction inquiries. Um, in New York, for example, um, there's a limitation on asking about youthful adjudication uh, issues. So um, many states do have some limitations, so you really do have to be careful about that if you've not you know, banned the box on your own application. Uh, the ability to work in the U.S., asking a proper immigration inquiry, um, you know, Questions you want to make sure you're not asking the wrong question here. What we're recommending um, uh, nowadays is to ask whether the person is an American citizen, lawful permanent resident of the United States, temporary resident, refugee, or asylee. Um, you know, and if no, there are some follow-up questions to ask. Um, so again, you want to make sure that you're up to date with respect to that. 
Many employment applications actually have an employment at will disclaimer included in the application, and, and as Steve will talk about later, uh, the National Labor Relations Board has been uh, hot to trot lately on, on employers' policies and procedures, um, and, and there have been changes to, to the employment at will statement um, that a lot of employers have in their handbooks and, and, and in their applications as well, so Steve will, will touch on that. Social security numbers. Different states have different rules with respect to social security numbers. My recommendation, not to include it on the, on the application. There'll be other times when you can ask for the social security number. It's really not important uh, usually to have it on the uh, employment application, and if it's not necessary to have it, I recommend not doing it. Uh, this is because there are certain states that have rules where, where you specifically can't include it on the application, but most states just have rules that uh, employers have to be careful about the way they use or display or dispose of documents uh, that have Social Security number information on them, so be aware of that. Uh, and while you're looking at your employment application, you want to think about things like, you know, are they up to date? Were they from this decade? Um, you, know, uh, you know, a lot of outdated questions I see on employment applications that were, you know, mimeographed from, you know, the 1970s. Um, but, you know, you might want to ask, uh, instead of just asking for a phone number, you might want to ask for their email address or their cell phone number. Um, Another issue is whether social media access or passwords are required in connection with an application. There are many states, and the most recent being Virginia, that have passed rules forbidding employers from asking about uh, or requiring applicants to provide their social media information, including passwords, so be aware of that. Um, there are also concerns about unemployment status. Um, jurisdictions like New York City, New Jersey, D.C., Oregon, uh, there are laws prohibiting discrimination based on unemployment status, so make sure uh, the tone of your application doesn't appear to, uh, to, sh to, to show that you're uh, you know, looking disfavorably upon somebody who has a, a period of uh, unemployment. Um, there's other required information uh, in other states. For example, some states have rules about um, asking about uh, work performed on a volunteer basis. Some states have requirements about polygraph testing notices. So again, just, just things to be aware of there. Um, so it's not just the handbook, it's not just uh, the application. There's other documents and procedures to keep in mind when thinking um, multi-jurisdictionally. Um, in terms of onboarding, a lot of state and city requirements lately to provide notices to employees, whether they're wage theft notices, uh, having uh, you know, dates of employment uh, uh, and, and, and information like that, pay dates, pay rates, things like that. Um, pregnancy accommodation notices, paid sick leave notices, um, and many of these laws require the employer to be able to uh, demonstrate acknowledgement of receipts. So you've got to be careful about how you're distributing those and how you're uh, documenting that indeed they have been distributed. Um, but, you know, talking about the handbook policies, as we said, there's a lot of different things that differ from state to state. Um, you know, a couple of the things to think about. Um, sexual harassment, for example. Some states require those policies to include information about how to contact, uh, whether it's the EEOC or the local fair employment practices agencies, about complaints. Um, sometimes you can, you have to do it in the handbook. Sometimes you can do it by handing out a pamphlet, uh, but there are some states that do have those requirements. Um, vacation, personal sick day rules, aside from the sick time laws we've talked about, um, you know, as many employers know, different states have different rules about uh, whether we can have use it or lose it policies, uh, you know, how we can accrue, whether we have to pay out on termination, so those are some differences from state to state. Nursing mother's information, some states have requirements um, whereby either employers need to hand out documentation to mothers returning from maternity leave, or alternatively, instead of doing that, if you have a handbook policy, that'll suffice. So many of our clients are now including nursing mothers and policies in their handbooks. But again, certain states actually do require it. Um, state family and medical leave laws you want to be aware of. So not only is there the SMLA, but many states have their state laws as well, and they should be referenced in the handbook too. Um, a lot of states are passing domestic violence leave laws, whether it's New Jersey, Florida, um, you know, and other different sort of small necessities laws as well. So, you know, when you are having state handbooks or local practices sections, you want to make sure you've got all the laws you need. Um, workplace violence uh, policies sometimes are necessary. You know, some of those policies address bringing weapons to work. Um, interestingly, uh, a lot of states nowadays have, have laws where employers can't prohibit employees from bringing guns to work and leaving them in their cars. Uh, believe it or not, 
Um, you know, and these laws differ from state to state. Sometimes it can be a locked car, sometimes it can't be in sight, but there's different rules, and believe it or not, as, as, as crazy as this may sound to some of us, um, you, you, you can't prohibit things like that, so that's something to, uh, to think about. Now, aside from these state issues, Steve's going to talk more detail. While we're going over our handbooks, and this is a really good time to do it, folks, um, the National Labor Relations Board has really been uh, going a little crazy lately and telling us what we can and can't have in our handbooks. So, um, you know, we'll talk about a lot more policies other than these as well. Uh, another issue to discuss is reasonable accommodation due to pregnancy. Several states and cities have passed pregnancy accommodation laws. Um, some of them apply when the applicant or employee is disabled due to pregnancy, such as Connecticut, Hawaii, Maryland. Um, but some of the other laws are broader. Um, you have to provide accommodations to employees and applicants just simply because they are pregnant, even if there's no disability associated with the pregnancy. Uh, New York City, Philadelphia, for example. Um, you know, a lot of these laws provide examples of the types of accommodations that can be provided, um, and many of them do have notice requirements, whether it's posting a notice in the workplace or handing out a notice to new employees. Um, you know, wanted to mention, so aside from the, the state laws and city laws, um, you know, we as employers really should be aware of, of how technology affects our policies and procedures as well. Um, you know, as you know, the law generally doesn't move as quickly as the technology, um, so there really are some things that we should think about logistically when we're updating our policies and procedures. Um, so just a couple things to think about with respect to company cell phones, smartphones, iPhones, iPads, you know, all, all that type of, of equipment. Um, you know, many of our policies say things like, you know, these phones, these devices are for business purposes only. Um, you know, in one of the recent cases that the board has, has just come out with, um, you know, they will say that you can't say that the email system is for business purposes only. Now, you know, they haven't specifically said that you must say that cell phones provided by the employer need to be able to be used for personal purposes, but I, I can't imagine that that's not coming. So you do want to think about that. And you also want to think about what your policy is, quite honestly. If you if you have a policy that you're not enforcing, you know, that, that's not a good thing either. Um, BYOD, bring your own device. Um, those types of policies and acknowledgements are really important when you're allowing employees to upload your confidential information onto their phones. Uh, having a policy or better yet an acknowledgement um, so that if a person wants to upload information onto their phone, they've got to agree um, that to the extent that they, it's lost or to the extent that they leave the company, you know, they allow you to, to wipe uh, their device. You know, very important to have done. Um, another issue that's really interesting is reimbursement for phone or service or data. Um, there's not too many states that are as advanced in this area as California, but you really do want to think about policies where, for example, you're just going to reimburse somebody a set amount each month and, and whatever that covers, it covers. Um, you know, certainly those types of policies are not going to be okay in California, you know, where you really do need to reimburse employees um, for, you know, what they, what they use for business purposes. Uh, another issue to think about is um, prohibiting recording or picture taking on devices, whether they're company devices or personal devices. Steve's going to talk about this in more detail as well. Um, but the board is really concerned about blanket policies prohibiting such recording, and, and Steve will tell you why. Um, one other issue to think about is, is just texting or talking on the phones while, while driving. Now, vast majority of, of states um, do not have laws that will sort of mitigate or eliminate an employer's liability in the event that the employee gets into some kind of a traffic accident while talking on the phone, even if it's for business purposes. If the employer has a policy that prohibits employees from talking on the cell phones for business purposes, but it's still a good idea. Um, the National Safety Council recently issued a report that addresses the importance of employers having such policies and, you know, that strictly prohibit employees using cell phones, whether talking or texting while driving, because these kinds of policies really are going to be an employer's best option when trying to defend against a liability claim. Um, you know, again, the employer is not going to be 100% free from liability, but, but implementing uh, these policies are really a good idea. But keep in mind, don't just implement the policy, you really want to enforce that policy as well. So um, I just want to mention, you know, one more thing before I, I turn uh, the, the, the stage over to Steve, um, is that the bag check, unfortunately, is still alive and kicking in California, at least. Um, you know, as you know, um, the, the Supreme Court came out and, and did speak to this issue, um, but, you know, California wage and hour law is, is a little bit different and, and more extensive than federal law. So do keep in mind that, uh, that this really is still an issue that employers need to think about, and in particular retailers, of course. So I'll now turn it over to Steve. Thank you, Susan, um, and 
thank you everybody for staying with us uh, for the past hour. Uh, one week from today, if uh, barring action either by the uh, U.S. District Court for te in Texas or the uh, District Court for the District um, in the District of Columbia, the National Labor Relations Board's new uh, amended uh, rules for representation elections are scheduled to take effect, and that is a very, very big deal. These are the most significant changes in uh, union in, in election procedures and rules for uh, employees to vote on whether or not they want to be represented by unions uh, since the National Labor Relations Act was passed 80 years ago. And um, we are seeing really with these new rules, assuming they do go into effect, and we've been at this point before, um, the culmination and the fruition of an effort by the Obama administration from uh, the start six years ago to repay some of its uh, labor supporters and its labor advocates um, through a, an NLRB that is much more pro-union, uh, pro-employee, and an anti-employer. And if we look at, you know, we, we know that there was the attempt to pass the uh, Employee Free Choice Act, which would have, uh, which, which failed in the Senate, but the, the new rules are really talking about um, changing the whole paradigm when representational elections take place. And when we talk about this, we're going to look at some of the other decisions that have come from the board in the past uh, five or six years that have really, um, you know, move the, move the needle in the direction that unions have been seeking to push it, um, have created more exposure for employers um, in situations where um, you know, they've never had liability before. And, uh, you know, this is all very outcome driven. You know, we'll, we'll talk about some of these things. So uh, the, the new election rules were adopted by the board on December 12, 2014. They were published in the Federal Register. Uh, they are scheduled to take effect, as I said, April 14th, a week from today. Uh, the bottom line in these rules, and we'll go through the specifics, is that they are designed to make elections much faster from the point where a union files a petition with the NLRB. Um, in the past, up until now, uh, the assumption has generally been that if an election petition is filed with the NLRB, that the employees are going to get to vote on the question of whether or not they want to be represented in somewhere in the 42 to 48 day range from the date of filing. The board's goal with these new election rules is that the vote will take place somewhere in the 25 to 30 day range. Um, if you've ever been involved in a union organizing drive in any of your operations, any of your businesses, or you know other people who have, um, you know how critical it is from an employer's perspective to have an opportunity to really communicate your message to your employees because at the time when the petition is filed, typically the union has, um, uh, you know, a strong support, typically 50, 60, 70 percent, if not more, uh, and the union times it with the assumption that, that they are going to be uh, cresting after that point. Um, from an employer's perspective, and many employers don't, you know, it's election by ambush, you don't learn that there's an organizing drive going on until you receive a fax or an email uh, or a phone call from the NLRB telling you that, there's an, that um, you know, whatever union it is, whether it's the RWDSU or the uh, UFCW or the Teamsters or whoever has filed a petition, you don't know about it and you can't start responding. Uh, what everybody has been saying about this is, the impact of these election rules is that it may create a, a scenario where, from an employer's perspective, we're in a constant state of campaign. That we're always going to be uh, acting and reacting and being ready for that petition that may come in tomorrow. Uh, one of the things we'll talk about as we go through this is the decision that came from the board about a year ago, two years ago, in specialty health care, which made it much easier for a union to pick a small group you know, typically it may be a department as opposed to all the sales associates in a given store um, and get an election in a group where they can win and get a toehold in the store or in the distribution center where uh, they may, you know, where they can then fight you from within and try to expand the scope of their organizing. 
One of the other things that's gone on with that, and it's uh, before the board now, we'll hear more about it, is the board's um, examination of joint employer issue. The, the most visible case on this has been McDonald's. It's gone to the question of um, you know, franchisors and franchisees being considered to be joint employers and uh, all the things that means in terms of where the election process goes and who is responsible for dealing with the union, either in the election stage or in collective bargaining if the union wins an election. Um, as I said, the board members uh, adopted this by a vote of three to two. Uh, they described these rules as not very significant, but that they're needed to quote, modernize and streamline the process. Uh, that's a very nice window dressing for what the reality of this is. Um, what's going to happen? In addition to faster elections, there are going to be a number of major procedural changes that are going to really impact um, and limit the ability of an employer to raise issues and to, def and to um, challenge the, the arguments that the union is making and the positions that it's taking. As I said, all of the time frames in the election process are going to be shortened substantially. Um, the employer is going to lose the ability to litigate a lot of the issues that we've typically dealt with at the representation hearing before an election takes place. Um, I mentioned the issues of scope. If somebody comes in and says they want to have a, um, a unit of shoe associates, and I think we've all heard a lot about the two cases that were decided by the board last year, one with uh, one of the Macy's stores up in Massachusetts where the NLRB uh, affirmed the regional director's direction of election among cosmetic and, and fragrance associates, and the other where the board um, disagreed with the regional director uh, who had found that a unit of, of women's shoe associates at the Bergdorf store in Manhattan was an appropriate unit. Employers are going to lose the ability to litigate those issues before the hearing. That is a huge, huge difference. The regional director is going to, you, can, you may be able to raise the issue, you may be able to, you'll have, in fact, you'll have to raise it. Uh, from an employer's perspective, you're going to have the obligation to raise all the issues that may exist, to make offers of proof before the election, before the hearing is held. And if you don't, those issues are going to be waived. So if you think something, you know, issues of supervisor, issue of uh, what the appropriate unit is. You're going to have to raise all those issues um, in a statement of position that's going to need to be filed no later than eight days after the petition is filed with the union, uh, with the labor board. And typically, it's going to be sooner than that. It's going to be the seventh day, the day before the hearing takes place. Very critical. Um, if you, you know, changes in terms of what information goes to a union when. Um, if you've been involved with this, you know typically you do not have, an employer does not have to produce a list of the names of the employees in the bargaining unit um, and their addresses until after there's either been an agreement for an election or um, an election has been directed after a hearing. Now, one of the, the new requirements is that the employer is going to have to provide the union and the labor board before the hearing takes place between two days after the petition is served on the employer with a list of all the names of the employees. And it's going to have to provide their addresses. It's going to have to provide, I'm sorry, not their addresses, their names, their shifts, their job classifications, the locations where they work. Uh, if, it's a, you know, if the employer has different, different, more than one facility. And one of the things that's critical with it is if you as the employer believe that the, that the unit that's been petitioned for is not the appropriate unit. For example, you have five stores in a particular city and the union is asked for one store and your position is the only appropriate unit is a multi-store unit because of the interchange between employees and the common control of labor relations and the fact they're under the same regional. You will have to give the union and the labor board the list of the names, the classification, shifts, et cetera, of all of the other employees at your other locations or in other departments who you believe uh, should be included in that unit. And essentially what you're turning over to the union in those circumstances is all the information they need to organize and go after the employees at those other locations. It's a huge tactical and strategic advantage for a union in that circumstance. Um, as I said, the hearings, right now we're used to having hearings in perhaps um, 
10, you know, a minimum of 10 days after the petition is filed. Uh, that's what the board shoots for. We've all had the experience of getting them pushed out to two weeks, sometimes even a bit further out. The, what the new rules say, within eight days of the petition, um, the only extension is going to, you know, you may get an additional two days in special circumstances. Anything beyond that is going to be extraordinary circumstances. You're not going to be able to establish those extraordinary circumstances. Uh, the critical piece, you're going to have to think about getting that uh, statement of position into the board before the election, before the hearing takes place. The board has now identified a form that they're, that they're using for this. They've begun training their, their staff, they're training um, employers and unions um, about how this is going to work. The NLRB did training on this in New York uh, a week and a half ago on March 26th. I think the most significant thing I can tell you about is when they held these, this training session, they didn't hold it at their own offices. They didn't hold it in a neutral site. They held it at the offices of the SEIU in their auditorium. That doesn't tell you something. It, you know, it, it certainly should. Um, you're going to have the, as I said, you're going to have to go into that hearing with all of your information, but you're not going to be able to litigate your issues. You're going to have to be able to lay out what all the facts are that you would decide. Um, you're going to have to be able to make offers of proof, essentially tell the labor board what you would be able to uh, show if you were allowed to call witnesses, and you're not going to have the ability to submit a brief at the end of the representation hearing, which you've always had for the last 80 years. The board is going to allow for employers in those circumstances or and unions to make oral argument at the end of the hearing. That hearing, which began no later than eight days after the petition was filed, those are radical changes. They are you know, really changing the, the way the deck is aligned. It's designed to help the union win the election. Um, this is all now, as I said if you were at the outset, there were two legal challenge, two lawsuits challenging this, um, one in Washington, one in Texas. National Retail Federation um, is a party in the lawsuit in Washington that was brought by uh, the U.S. Chamber of, the Chamber of Commerce of the United States. The Texas case was brought by the Associated Builders and Contractors of Texas. Um, there were a number of legal theories as to why um, they believe these rules should not take effect. Uh, you'll have the deck. You're, you know, this is going to be in the. You know, it's going to be really front page news between now and the 14th. I expect we'll see a decision on this. At this point, there has not been a request for an injunction. Uh, that is, the, 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 the plaintiffs in the lawsuits challenging the rules have not asked the courts to keep the rules from going into effect uh, while the cases are litigated. That's a significant difference from what happened in 2011 when there were similar uh, rules that had been adopted by the, the NLRB in 2010 that were scheduled to take effect in 2011. The challenges in 2011 to the 2010 rules were successful, but they were successful for, reason, for reasons that are not um, part of the lawsuits that are being brought now. Those had to do with the fact that those rules were adopted by um, a, a less than full board. There weren't five members. It was at a point where there were recess appointees um, whose status um, as members of the board had essentially, uh, you know, was under serious challenge in the courts and, and ultimately was found not to be valid uh, appointments. Uh, all I can tell everybody in this room is to think about um, if these rules are going to affect what are the uh, situations where you're going to where you're going to face units. What are the units that are going to try to be organized? What is your communication strategy with your employees? What is your strategy in terms of how you're going to respond and get ready to be in this continuous campaign mode? Um, the slides here on the micro bargaining units were really interesting. We had these two decisions that came out of the board in the summer uh, with Macy's and Bergdorf, to which um, one went one way, the other went the opposite way. It said the, the small unit of cosmetics at Macy's was an appropriate unit, the shoe unit at Bergdorf's was not. Um, you know, these are very fact-driven. They're very specific to the cases. Um, you know, if, if you read them, uh, you can, you know, scratch your head because they don't really make a lot of sense. Um, you, know, the, you know, the factors that, that the board looks at, 
you know, the line of demarcation, one of the things that was, was most significant in finding the shoe unit at Bergdorf's was not an appropriate unit was how the operating units and the uh, management structure in that store were set uh, while, while the cosmetics and fragrance uh, department at, at the Macy's store in Massachusetts had its own managers. Um, you know, the shoe unit at Bergdorf's was essentially part of the ready-to-wear and designer wear and an overall furnishings and garment uh, department and that structure and the board placed a lot of weight on that. Uh, I don't think they really did everybody a big favor, you know, because they didn't give clear guidance. Um, McDonald's case that's coming, joint employers, everybody in retail, think about um, in your building or in your distribution centers, the uh, types of, of personnel who are there who may not be your employees, whether it's a vendor who operates food and beverage or operates the employee cafeteria, or whether it's um, industrial cleaning who comes in and cleans the store, uh, cleans the distribution center, whether it's a trucker who is bringing your goods from your distribution centers to your locations and is a dedicated trucker. Um, the board is um, is looking at, looking at, you know, McDonald's is getting all the press, the big case to be thinking about something called Browning Ferris, and also a decision that came out of the NLRB last month involving CNN and one of its contractors for um, providing some of the camera and news gathering services for the CNN network, it's a case that took about five years to get through the board. Um, the traditional standard has been whether or not the, um, a party, so whether it's the retailer, is exercising common control over the employees of the vendor who's operating and who's providing services in the store, whether it's building services, whether it's maintenance, janitorial, food service. If you're exercising control, you're assigning their schedules, you're working out who's working in the department, you're, you know, those are the things that until now have been deemed to be the standard for determining whether or not you're the, you are a joint employer with the, the actual employer. Under the proposed test that the board is looking at um, and that the general counsel of the board has urged it to adopt, um, they're asking that they look at something um, that they refer to as the economic realities, that if, the, if those employees of the contractor are involved in supplying, um, you know, the, the, tr the work in the building that, and that the, um, the, the putative employer, that's the store, um, has an, um, is able to control the economic terms of its subcontracts. Um, so it may be the pricing of the subcontractor services or when they have to have their personnel in your store or your distribution center. Um, and that your pricing with them is reflected in that the, the, the general counsel is urging that in that circumstance, the retailer um, has indirect control and that that indirect control should be sufficient for it to be deemed to be a joint employer with the contractor. Um, that is a huge thing because, you know, as the uh, SEIU is urging in the McDonald's cases, what that would mean is if uh, the employees at a particular store, uh, franchisee vote to be represented by a union, the franchisor would have to be at the bargaining table, would have to produce information, and is a party to that bargaining relationship. In your instances where it's a matter of where you can say, well, I want to change who does the cleaning of the store, I want to change who my outside trucker is, you may lose the ability to do that because if you're doing it because of economic factors that are driven by um, wages and, and terms of conditions, um, the board may say that you're doing it because employees have engaged in, their, in protected activity. That is what the outcome was in the CNN case that I spoke about. We're adding that to the PowerPoint. Um, I know. I'm just going to move quickly through a few of the other things that we talked about. The slides are here on this. Um, there's some pointers that we have on really what you should be thinking about, what you should be looking at now in terms of how to be ready for the new rules that are going into effect, how to do training, how to do, you know, really critical self-assessment of how you're structured, what the arguments you would make are. You want to know where you are in terms of your competitiveness, what the conditions are. 
you know, as, as Valerie mentioned earlier, with you know, none of these things are happening in isolation. Um, you know, as, as OSHA requires the safety and health and accident and injury data to go up on a facility by facility basis, as, as Val said, it's, you know, it's not the employees or the public who are looking at. It's the unions that want to see it so they can say you have an employer that's providing you with an unsafe environment. You need a representative who's going to protect you on that. Um, and who can really sit down and, 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 and raise your interest at the bargaining table because you can't rely on your employer. Uh, we have here some, you know, in the slides, points about really what to look for. You know, what are some of the signs uh, when something's going on in the store in terms of organizing? Um, you know, my instinct is, you know, anything that is unusual that doesn't make sense isn't, you know, should be identified, it should be flagged, it should be fed up the chain. So that people can figure out what's going on. If something happens once in one location, Maybe a coincidence, but if it doesn't get to HR or legal, um, you're not going to find the patterns, and that's going to be really critical with this. Um, the board has really been looking at handbooks, work rules. Um, they're looking at it in non-union environments. Um, the big thing that they talk about is the idea that employees have the right to engage in concerted protected activity. That does not just mean uh, talking to a union, having a union, it means talking among themselves, it means talking with the media, it means filing complaints with OSHA, with the Department of Labor, with the Justice Department, any of the other things we've talked about in this program here today. And the board is taking this very broad view. There's a great memo that the, G that the General Counsel just issued um, two weeks ago uh, that really focuses on and summarizes some of the handbook material that they've looked at. It came out of a settlement that they did with Wendy's, um, and it's not clear. I believe, you know, I've been looking for facts. I believe it had to do with company-owned stores as opposed to franchisee stores, but really what it talked about is a whole host of issues of, you know, and the, the basic standard of your work rules, your policies, what's in the handbook, is whether an employee is reasonably going to construe the rule to prohibit Section 7 activity. That means their ability to talk to their coworkers and to take action together with their coworkers about their terms and conditions of employment, whether it's going in to complain about safety, whether it's asking for a raise together, um, talking about what the scheduling is, talking about um, how, um, you know, supervisor treatment of employees, all of these subjects. Um, areas where they talk about confidentiality, you have employees have the right to discuss their wages, hours, and other terms and conditions with their coworkers, with non-employees, and with union representatives. Um, they have the right to criticize and, pro and or protest their employer's policies or their treatment of employers. Um, and that means they can post on their soup on their Facebook page or elsewhere that they think that their that their supervisor or their manager is a jerk. Um, generally because they related it to something that he did in the workplace. Um, so it was a case that was decided uh, a couple of weeks ago, a recent case involving triple play sports bar. Um, employees withholding was messed up. They, the, they talked about uh, on two employees were chatting on Facebook about the employer being a thief, being dishonest, being a jerk, and, you know, and things I'm not going to say on this phone call. And the board said that's a labor dispute. They're talking about their terms and conditions of employment, and they're exchanging their ideas. When the employer fired those employees for posting that on the, on the Facebook page, that was protected activity, that, and, and the board has taken the position they need to be reinstated with full back pay. Um, same thing with contact to the employee, to the fellow employees. You know, um, employees fighting, yelling at each other in the workplace, Intemperate, abusive, and inaccurate statements can be protected. That's the takeaway here. You know, looking even back, you know, Susan said it's a great time to think about what's in your handbook because you're going to need to. Things that the common sense and intuition said, you know, would be fine uh, and, are, and are necessary to protect your employees and provide them with a harassment free workplace. You know, the board is now going to say, well, employee, you know, the reasonable employee is going to view that. As impeding and interfering with their with their rights under the National Labor Relations Act, um, talking to the media, you know, we all have. It's very common to have policies that you know the, the only people who speak to the media on behalf of the company are media relations, the general counsel's office, you know, somebody who has that responsibility. 
Um, if you have a broad prohibition that says you can't talk to the press, you can't talk to anyone else about what's going on here, the NLRB is going to say that that's a violation. It's interfering with employees' rights. Um, they have a right under Section 7 to communicate with the news media. That's a quote from uh, General Counsel Griffin's um, memo last month. They have the right, you know, and the, the standard is going to be whether employees would reasonably view it as restricting their communications. If that's the case, it's going to be unlawful. Um, you have a trademark. You have a logo. You're going to say hey, nobody can put my store's logo on their Facebook page or on their, um, their own materials. The board has said, you know, and, and the, the, if you read this section of the memo, the general counsel is defining on patent and trademark law and intellectual property law. They said that employees are going to see a broad prohibition like that as unlawfully interfering with their rights because they have the ability, they have the right to put it on their flyers that they give out outside the store. They can put your logo and your name. They can put it on their picket signs. They can put it on the banners when they have a demonstration. Um, all things to look at. As Susan said, um, you know, workplace, you know, a lot of us say you can't take photos in the workplace. You can't make recordings of your conversations with your supervisor and manager. Um, the general counsel says that employees have the right to photograph. They have the right to make recordings. These are all really factual, you know, fact-specific uh, decisions. And what they mean is you need to look at how, they, not just what your handbook says, but what happens when you have a case to come from. What happens when somebody is taking pictures in the break room? When somebody, you know, walks into a meeting with their supervisor or their manager, whether it's a disciplinary meeting or a town hall or something or some other meeting, and they decide they're going to record this and they're going to post it on their Facebook page or they're going to distribute it to everybody. These are not easy uh, decisions. They're, they're fact-specific. And, and, and it's all counterintuitive. Um, leaving work, one of my favorites. A lot of, a lot of employers have rules. If you can't leave the workplace during the workday, you know, you, you stay for your shift. General counsel view is that's interfering with one of the most fundamental rights people have, the right to go on strike. Um, and if someone reads this, reads this and says you can't leave work during the day, they're going to say, oh, that you know, a reasonable employee is going to find that they're prohibited from engaging in a strike or a walkout. I don't think so, but that's that's what you, that's the environment we're in now. Uh, I'm going to leave you here because I know we've gone over, but with leaving work, um, one last thing I did say we would talk about is purple communications, um, the use of email in the workplace. Um, December 14, 2014, um, the NLRB issued a decision in a case called purple communication. It changed the law 180 degrees. You used to have the ability to say you can't use the company's work on email systems for non-work purposes or for union activity or concerted protected activity. And, and the board said that's because it's your property as the employer. And you have a right to control who uses your property. But this board in a three to two decision said, it's, you know, yeah, there's a property interest involved, but the property interest is secondary in this case to a balancing with the employee's right to engage in concerted activity and, to engage, and therefore um, you can, it's presumptively unlawful to tell employees they cannot use your work email system to communicate with one another or with others about their terms and conditions of employment, which includes union activity. Um, the case did not specifically talk about instant messaging. It did not talk about cell phones. It did not talk about those types of technology. But it made it very clear that when those issues come before the board, they're going to look at it and that's, they're going to put it in the same crucible. And I think we can tell you which way it's going to come out. And it's not the way that people on this call would like it to. Um, you know, I'd love to talk to you if you have questions. I have a lot of material that's not covered. You'll see the slides. I have to leave my service dogs out, too. Um, and uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you all for joining us today. In approximately two to three business days following the webinar, Epstein Becker Green will communicate the availability of the PowerPoint um, and the webinar recording. And although our speakers uh, were unable to reply to any of your questions during the allotted time today, they will certainly follow up directly to your inquiries. And let, with this? Let me just add one thing. The last slide that's up there, uh, we have a very detailed program that is set for next week 
for those of you who are in the New York area that's dealing specifically in, in a lot more depth about what you can and should be doing to deal with uh, the new election rules and the other board decisions that we've talked about. Um, it's next uh, Tuesday the 14th at the Hilton in Westchester and Rybrook. Uh, we are also presenting that program in Los Angeles on May 7th, uh, and we'll be uh, offering those materials elsewhere um, if you're on our website or on our email list. Uh, but we encourage uh, anybody who has an interest and is able to make it to join us for those programs. Thank you very much, and this will conclude today's webinar. Take care.